future man. We're going to start in the beginning. And I want to talk about body, soul, and spirit. You guys have probably heard a lot of teaching and have some belief and some understanding of what you think man's, how man was created, how man's made. I want to show you from a biblical perspective exactly how we are and what we are. So Genesis 1 is where we should start because that's where we see God being created, or man being created by God. Genesis 1, let's go to 26. We read 26 and 27. Who's there? Oh, man, I love that head wrap you got on. I do that too. That is cool. Can I pull that off? Yes, you could. You look great with your beard. I have plenty of scarves. <laughs> did you next, make next, it next or did you buy it? Did you make it? Is it a scarf? No, what's on your head? Like this. It's just a scarf. And you made it all up like that? Yeah. I want to learn how to do that. This <laughs> trailer's next, YouTube video. Next, next, video. Video. next Bible study is going to be a 15 yeah. minute scarf tying. You know, I'm here. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, who's there? 26, 27. Go ahead, Nick. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds okay, of the sky. And over the man <laughs> in. What's it say next? Our image. Our image. Okay. Who is our? Uh, God's. God's. Okay. So we know God is made in... Sorry, man is made... I keep wanting to say that. Man is made in God's image. Okay? So, before I go into the our image part, we have to talk a little bit about how all of us currently think. Okay? One of the things I like to do when I'm teaching is I like to spend a little time showing you how you think and why you think the way you think. Okay? And it's important because if we can deter, if we can kind of unveil how we think, we're going to realize that some of the ways we think will influence the way we read Scripture. And the way Scripture was originally written is not necessarily in the same mindset as the way we currently think. Okay? So the best thing we can do is to take on, if we want to get the most out of the Bible, then we have to take on the mindset in which the Bible was written. Okay? The thought process in which it was written. So, give me a, just give me some insight. What was the current mindset, Old Testament, New Testament, whatever? What are some descriptions of the mindset or the culture of when the Bible was written? Or from your perspective. There were, all the other cultures had... Multiple gods. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else? I mean, it was it was kind of like a radical way of thinking. Um, the Bible. Yeah. Even at that time. Even at that time. Mm -hmm. I might be wrong on this one, but we were also fearful. We were fearful for God's wrath and vengeance. Definitely in the Old Testament, for mm -hmm. sure. In fact, even a lot of them in the New Testament were still living with Old Testament mindset of God. Yeah. Yeah. We wanted to please God. Yeah. Let me give you a really quick example of that. Let me show you the difference. And again, this has nothing to do with my lesson, but I think it'll really help you. Is uh, so we got God up here, we've got Jesus here, this is the cross, and we've got man. Okay? And Harold Everly does a really good job on this teaching, and I'm gonna completely destroy it, but that's okay. <laughs> but I want you to see this, okay? And the term that we use for what Jesus did for man, the biblical term is called atonement. Anybody ever heard that term before? Yep. Okay, to make atonement for sin means that something takes the place of something else. To atone for something means that something cleanses and takes the place of something else. Okay? So, we, uh, one view, and this is the majority of the view of the church, believes that Jesus on the cross took all of God's wrath for us. And why was God mad at people? Because of sin. Okay? Sin was all over this guy. Okay? So, Jesus hangs on a cross, dies on a cross, and what killed Jesus was what? Our sins. Well, in this model, it's the wrath of God towards sin. Okay? Now, who's ever heard that teaching? That God took out all of his wrath about mankind and about sin on his son. You even have probably heard the idea that God turned his head because he couldn't even look 
on his son. Why? Because Jesus was taking on the sins, of the world. sins of the world. And God can't live with sin. God can't you know, dwell in the same place as sin. So the idea was that Jesus was taking all the wrath of God for all of us. First Timothy talks about this. I find it. Okay. So that's one view. Okay? And then what Jesus does is he, he pays for our sin. Jesus' death pays for our sin. Okay? So, debt paid. What do you got? First Timothy 5. But the goal of our instruction is love for a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. For some man is trained from things, from these things have turned aside to fruitless discussion. When wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand, either what they are saying or the matters about which they are making confident assertions. But we do not know the law. But we do know the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that law is not made for a righteous man, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, and for those who are ungodly, and sinners and unholy and profane, and those who kill their fathers and or mothers for murderers. And it goes on and on. It pretty much says that it doesn't matter who you are. That's why God, Jesus died on the cross is for our sins. Correct. And it goes on and on. Okay. So, let me show you what he's saying here, how there's two different views of how God did just what he's saying right there. Okay? There's two different views. The first view is, is that Jesus takes all of this wrath of God because of our sins. Right? And then he pays our debt. How many people have heard that? That yeah. we had a debt to God that we could not pay. Yeah. Right? So Jesus comes in and pays the debt we owed. There's no way we could pay it. The wages of sin is... Yeah. That's why Jesus dies on the cross. Okay? So, so that's one view. There's another view over here. Is that... Okay, we're going to call this wrath. Okay? This is the wrath of God. Here, what happens is... Here, there's a different view. And atonement takes on a different name. Because instead of uh, the wrath of God being poured out on Jesus... What Jesus is doing is he's establishing something called a covenant. Okay? That's why we have an Old Testament and a New Testament. Really, it's an old covenant and a new covenant. Okay? What Jesus is doing, if you look at Jewish law, he's cutting a covenant. Okay? Jesus is shedding blood and he's cutting a covenant. And what he's saying to his father is he says, Father, the blood that I am shedding is for the sins of mankind. Okay? Just like in the Old Testament, you'll see that they had to shed blood of animals in order to remit the sins of the, of the population of Israel. Okay? Same thing. What he does here is Jesus says, I am going to shed my blood, and I'm going to establish in my blood a new covenant between God and man. And in that covenant, I'm going to ask you to do something that you have never done before. I'm going to ask you to once and for all forgive their debt. Okay? So here, over here, debt paid. Over here, debt forgiven. What's the difference between debt paid and debt forgiven? Debt paid, you paid it back. Debt yeah. forgiven means it's gone. It's gone. It's and did you have to pay anything? No. No. Why? Why in this case do we not have to pay anything? Someone else because it's already it. done. No, well, actually, no. The, 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 the person who you are in debt to said, I'm wiping it out. Aha! See, nobody paid this debt. See, the atonement is not Jesus paying a debt for us. Otherwise, it's not forgiveness. Okay? If you forgive a debt, what are you doing? Paying it off. No. No. Oh, no. You no longer owe it. Right. It's still owed, but you no longer owe it. Why? Because someone stepped inside and said, My blood is a new covenant. Okay? There is a big difference between this and this. And the difference is this. We think God's wrath is being staved off by a Jesus who is standing between the wrath of the Father and the people who are in sin. Okay? The only thing that actually separates any of us from the wrath of God is this Jesus who died and he's the son and he's shaped like, kind of like a Superman pushing back all of the wrath of God. It's not true. That's not what Scripture talks about. Scripture talks about that that is gone. There is no longer wrath directed toward anyone who lives in this covenant. 
of debt forgiven. You guys with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Two different mindsets. Okay. Now, someone would say, sitting in this room, that might have this mindset, Mark, it's really no different. It's completely different. Mm -hmm. Let me show you how it's completely different. We got hands up everywhere. <laughs> All right, go, Ben. What's the significance, then, in this um, the covenant version of Jesus dying on the cross? Why is that necessary, or what was... Because there is no covenant unless there is what? Blood. blood. Shedding of blood. Mm -hmm. Okay, That's the only way he could enact that covenant. And the only way the covenant could be lasting and significant is if his own blood shed it. You would, you would see throughout the Old Testament, and even in the New Testament, they were still shedding the blood of lamp shedding the blood of lambs. Okay? Blemished, unblemished lambs. That's who he was. In fact, we find out later now that he's actually called the Lamb. Lamb of God, the Lamb who took away, took away the sins of the world. That's what John first called him when he came on the scene. You remember that? Yeah. The Lamb! Behold, who takes away the sins of the world. Okay. Go ahead, Barbara. Well, and what I see is the difference is you've got anger, punishment, letter of the law, rules, regulations over here, unconditional law. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. At some point in time, this debt, at some point in time, this debt is going to be like, you know what, I can, you know, I'm staving it off and I'm staving it off, but someday you're going to have to come face to face with him. Okay? I, I, look, I'm not looking forward to coming to get somebody who's still angry with me, even if Jesus is standing between us. Okay? The, the actual New Testament talks about a covenant where the blood was shed and the forgiveness was offered. And now the sins are erased, not because someone else paid them, but because of an atonement where shedding blood has taken place and now a newness has come. You guys realize this? Now, the wrath of God is still on people. You guys realize this, right? Scripture is true. That's where I thought he was going. The wrath of God is still on people who do not walk in this covenant. And there will be people that don't walk in this covenant. There are people right now in our lives walking around on the earth, that are not walking in this covenant with the Lord. You guys with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is this what James talks about? First James? There's only one James. Yeah, James. Okay. Chapter 1. What's he talking about? Um, it's like James, a bonded servant of the God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the twelve tribes who are despised, um, who despised of our agreements. But it keeps talking about it. And I've read this before, and it's never really made sense to me. And now that you're doing this, it's kind of clicking in my mind. Yeah. This I think it's similar. Yeah, it is. We have to talk a little bit more about some of the specifics in James, because there's some more specific things in there that he attests to. But this is an overall view of the act of Jesus on the cross. And there are two very radical, different, radically different ways of looking at it. Let me give you an example of this in real life. Okay? I'm working with a couple right now who's having uh, inner family somewhat struggles, for example. I'll just leave it at that. And the struggles have to do with one... Uh, one, how is it? one sister not forgiving a sister-in-law. Okay? And the sister-in-law is saying, please forgive me. I have done these things, and I forgive you for the things you have done to me. Okay? And she's not asking for any kind of asking for forgiveness in return. She's not asking for you to come and for you to <clears throat> pay any debts or anything like that. Okay? The sister of her husband, that's who it is, is still calling for a family meeting. She says, I'm willing to forgive you, but first we have to have a family meeting. And in that family meeting, we need to hash out some things. And what she's going to basically do, she wants to sit in this family meeting, and she wants to lay out before all the people all the sins of her sister-in-law. And so what she's going to do, has anybody experienced this? What they do is they flush out everything that has hurt me about what you've done to me, and then, once I feel better, mm -hmm. I'll forgive you. Well, where does that leave the sister-in-law? Mm -hmm. Now, all of this junk is piled on top of her, but now the sister feels better because I have now dumped all of this out, and now she gets to do what? She has to pay the debt. Okay? To people she didn't wrong. She did, well, no, she, she did wrong. No, I mean, to the... Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, she did wrong. Was there was wrongs both ways. But there's two different ways forgiveness is being offered. In the first way, the lady over here is saying, you know what, I don't even need you to ask for my forgiveness. I'm just going to offer it freely. You know why? Because I've already been offered it freely. 
She recognizes that the love of God is toward her, and so she offers it freely. You don't even need to come. You don't have to list off the things you've done wrong. I just forgive you. I forgive you because it's the right thing to do. I forgive you because I've been so abundantly forgiven. The other one says, all right, I might do that, but I first, I'm going to pile it on. I'm going to want you to kind of crawl through some mud for me. Do you see the difference? She over there believes in this kind of redemption, this kind of atonement where the wrath of God is still waiting to be poured out on you. Now, your debt was, was paid, but it was paid with blood. Then I have a question. Okay? But over here, it's just forgiven out of what? Out of love. Out of love. Go ahead. So, when they say, and I don't know if the Bible says this, or I've just been taught this, probably just taught. Um, so, whenever we, like the whole judgment day, like, does that even exist since we're already forgiven? On the right side? Since we're already forgiven, then Someone go to John we have to 3. go to judgment? Really quick. Let me answer your question for you. Okay. okay. With scripture. Okay, John 3 what? Oh, let's say 17. <coughs> for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world should be saved through him. Keep going. The one who believes in him is not condemned. The one who does not believe has been condemned already. All right, go back. Now, I need someone's version that doesn't have the word condemned, but actually has a more judged. Judged. Say it again now with the word judged. Verse 17, 18. So then, no. God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already. Judgment's already happened. Okay. That's cool. <laughs> That's pretty cool, though, isn't it? It is cool. Yeah. We don't focus on that judgment. We focus on the, the great white throne judgment in uh, Revelations. You know what the great white throne judgment's all about, right? Your deeds will be judged. You come before the throne and say, you know what? You served in love, Julia. And I loved how you did this. And I loved how you wrapped things around your head. And it was so beautiful. <laughs> and you taught others how to do it. And it was such a service to mankind. <laughs> That's the kind of judgment that's going to happen. Did you love? That's judgment's already happening. What will you do with Jesus? That's the judgment in the earth right now. What will you do with Jesus? The light comes into the world, and it says some, no, no, I can't, no. And then some say, oh, there he is. So uh, if you have someone that you care about in your life, and they don't believe but their wife goes to church, how do you sit down and talk with them and try and get them to see the light and to, to start that conversation to soften their heart? Because right now it's like a rock. You start the conversation by loving them and by encouraging the wife to be a godly, loving example to her husband. That's what Peter tells the wife to do. And then you, as a friend or whatever you are, uh, you love that man. And you, every opportunity to serve him and show him who Christ was. Christ said, I am the greatest of all, but I come to serve. I, I become the least of all. How do you become the greatest in the kingdom? You become the servant of all. That's how you do it. If you want to see the kingdom come in that guy's life, serve him. Serve him in love. How do you get somebody that believes the left side to believe the right side? Same way. Okay, so let's go back to the example I had of the sister and the sister-in-law. The reason why that sister-in-law over there wants the sister, or vice versa, sorry, to pay for the sins is because she believes this about God. She believes this about Jesus. She believes that Jesus is staving off the wrath of God on her behalf. So when, when someone wrongs her, her belief is the wrath of God is still very much valid. And so her wrath toward that person's sin is valid. And if you want my forgiveness, so be it. But you're going to have to pay first in order to get my forgiveness. Why? Because Jesus paid a debt instead of forgave a debt. You with me? Mm -hmm. This girl over here who I said was standing over here just freely offered forgiveness because it was freely offered to her. She actually showed her theology. And now she believed. Go ahead. Mark, you said that, that some people are walking in the covenant with God and some are walking outside the covenant. Correct. Are these people walking outside the covenant? Are they still under God's grace? No, I would say no, they're not. Okay. I would say they're not. And, you know, I, 
for example, the man that he was speaking of who has a wife, <coughs> you said? His wife goes to church. Loves the Lord, goes to church. Would you say that he has a relationship with the Lord or no? No, he doesn't believe in anything. Okay, he well, just believes you, you die total darkness. So, in this example, she is in the covenant. Okay, The shed blood is available to him. The forgiveness is made available to him. But until he walks in that, he is outside of this and still walking in the wrath. His choice. It's all forgiven. It's all available to him to walk in. The grace that he just mentioned. Okay? The reason why I only, I only brought this up to show a difference of thinking. Okay? And I'm going to show you this difference of thinking in another example here. And my eraser stinks. I should have thought about this ahead of time. Can I ask you a question when you're Go ahead. Let's say you were brought up in the grace of God. And then at some point in your life you decided to step outside of it. And you can fight outside of it. But you decide to step back into God's grace. Where do you stand with God? All right, were you here two weeks ago when we talked about what grace really is? Yeah. What is grace? It's God's love. I was here. We were in the other what, what, what is the grace of God? You guys remember what the definition the power. is? The ability. The divine enablement of the Lord in us. Okay? So, the idea of walking out from grace means you decide to do life on your own. Outside of His ability to walk with Him and in, 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 in Him. Okay? <laughs> So, you can walk away. I mean, Hebrews talks about a man who believes in the Lord and believe and walks his way and then turns away and decides not to believe again. And then remember the Hebrews writer says, how could the blood be shed again? Because mm -hmm. it can't be shed twice. Okay? So, he actually talks about that there is a great judgment for that one. Okay? That's not you. That's not you. Now, we do have moments where any of us probably try to do it on our own. Okay? We live in that. But we live in relationship. And there's a growing relationship. The kind of thing that you're talking about is someone who just decides on their own, you know what, that's it. This God thing isn't real, it's not alive, it doesn't work. And then they turn away and they live the rest of their life in that atheistic, God doesn't exist mindset. They're back out of the wrath. So they never get forgiven. If they turn again. So if they come back. I think it's possible that they can come back, absolutely. And if they do come back, they, it's possible. Mm -hmm. Will they be able to be forgiven? I hope. I do, I hope. It's the desire of the Father that none perish, but all have eternal life. He wants all of his kids home. We've talked about this. Okay, i got to get back to this. You keep me on track, not off track. I need a wet paper towel. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. Anyway, okay, so man is made in the image of God. I'm just going to spit on So man is made in the image of God. And he says it's made in our image. Okay? So we think, believe it or not, you're a Westerner. Westerner. Okay? That doesn't mean you have to live on the West Coast. What would you say? Howdy. Oh, how? how? <laughs> okay? Western thought process comes from Greek. I Westerner. <laughs> Greek. You guys do realize this is being videoed and recorded? Yeah. Okay? It's great. You make it entertaining for the people who are. <laughs> okay? Western thought comes from Greek Roman thought. Okay? Remember how I talked about originally what was the Bible mindset, how it was written, what it was written in? Okay, obviously the Old Testament was written from a Hebrew point of view. Okay? And then the, the Hebrews, after Malachi, spend a period of time where they eventually end up part of what empire? Roman Empire. Sorry, man. Persian first. But the Roman Empire, you're right. <laughs> Thank you. You're right. Roman Thanks came for after Persia. But it was Roman Empire in what region? If you go into the New Testament, then. Greek. Okay? It was the Greek region. Okay? The, Greeks, the Greek mindset was prevalent throughout the region that the growing church was being, was, uh, being born in and developed in. And you have... Uh, Aristotle, and actually he was the latest of the three. Plato and Socrates, names like that ring a bell? Mm -hmm. You ever hear them? I used to study them in school. I need yeah. to draw one now. You didn't spit on that one, did you? Oh, uh, no. Okay. <laughs> so these guys were very influential at that time. And the Jews were becoming part of this culture. 
Okay? They were growing in this culture over the last several hundred years prior to Jesus coming. And the Greeks had a way of thought called, uh, have you ever heard of Helen of Troy? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Have you ever heard of the term Hellenized? Yeah. Okay. In fact, you will see in Scripture that there was a group of Jews called what? Hellenized, Hellenized Jews. Okay. These were ones that were still Jews, but they began to adopt Greek culture. They began living, walking, thinking like a Greek, though they were still Jews. You guys with me so far? Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the culture and the mindset in which Jesus comes into. They're still Jews. They still have a, an understanding of the law. They still follow the law. They're still Pharisees and high priests and, and scribes and all these things. But they're in the midst of the Roman Empire, Greek culture. And the Roman Empire, if there was something that was... Um, very Roman was the idea of order. Okay, if you watch the uh, any movies about the Romans, they they fought in very specific regiments and they were very orderly. And then the Greek mindset was very much uh, categorized. Everything had a category. Everything had to be placed in a certain box. So you can imagine how these two got along. Okay? If everything's got a box, everything's got a category, and Romans are all about order, before long, everything's got to fit into a tight little nice box, or we're going to force it to. Okay? Yeah, so they were Germans. Huh? They were Germans. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> but that's, they were very much Western thought. Mm -hmm. In fact, all of Europe began to adopt Western thought. Augustine adopted Western thought. All of our forefathers of our faith were very much this way. And it's, it's, it's completely permeated our culture today. So much of what we do in our society, we have no idea how it relates back to Greek and Roman thought. A lot of the, if you go to any psychology class that Maddie's taking, or any of the uh, sociology, sociology classes you take, they're based on Aristotle, Socrates, Plato. Okay, so now, think of it, now we're thinking like this, and then we think in terms of man in our image. Who is our in this scripture? Genesis 1, 27. God. God's image, okay? But why would he say our? Trinity. Trinity. So who is the our? God, Jesus. Father, Father Son, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay, so immediately, Greek-Roman thought, categorized orderly thought, automatically says this. And it does make sense to a certain extent. If we're made in his image, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit... Then you start to get the idea, wait a minute, now I'm starting to see where body, soul, and spirit comes from. You guys with me so far? Okay. So the idea of body, I don't know, you can say, I'm not exactly sure how you want to mark these. I don't think there's really a big deal here. But we begin to see a correlation in how we are made versus how God is. You see that? He's three parts, so are we. And this is legitimate, body, soul, and spirit. Okay, it's legitimate. Now let me show you how that is. Okay, so we see that uh, Genesis 1.27, how is Adam formed? Let's talk about this. How is Adam formed? He's formed how? What does God do? Okay, so from the dust of the ground or the clay, he makes Adam's body. body. And then what does he do? He breathes. He breathes. He breathes into him. Where does that come from? Okay, this is the breath of life from the Spirit. Okay? So, God's Spirit breathes onto clay and He becomes a what? What's it say? A living soul. Living soul. Guys, okay, see that? Holy Spirit, His Spirit, the breath of life breathed into clay becomes a living soul. This is how God makes man. It's beautiful. In fact, this word breath of life in the, in the Hebrew is the word ruah, which means breath. It's a beautiful illustration. I'm just, just breathing in. In fact, I heard Harold tell this one time. He talks about how Eskimos, I don't know if you've ever heard this before. You think Eskimos just kiss by touching noses? You know what they actually do? This is, this is really powerful. He actually, the wife stands there with her mouth open, and the husband breathes into her mouth, not touching and then she breathes in what he breathes out, and she in turn breathes it back into him, and he inhales what she breathes into him. And they actually say that that's a more intimate connection 
than if they were to touch physically. And it's because they think, they actually believe that there's spirit in the breath. And when there's an exchange of spirit, then there's oneness that goes beyond anything physical that takes place. It's a beautiful illustration. Who do you like? No, I think. All right, good. All right, so we've got the rule. I'm actually following some notes tonight, so get ready for this. So Adam becomes a living soul when the clay mixes with the breath of life. You guys realize this, this happens every day in a woman's womb. This doesn't change at all. Remember how we talked about the imagination of God first thinks and creates? Like, thought about Randy how many years ago? 30? Two. 32 years ago. Okay? And he thinks about Randy, and then two people get together and decide to take clay, put the clay together. You with me? Mm -hmm. And then when the DNA, just think about this. No, my pen's already done. DNA, like mom DNA plus dad DNA, inside this DNA, we were all born in Adam. That's scripture. Okay, I'm not going to go find that scripture for you. You can find it someday. But in Adam, we all were created. Okay? That in that DNA is both clay and spirit. I love it. The idea that God's spirit is in that DNA. How do we know this? John 1. Somebody, if you want to go there, you can go there really quick. John 1 talks about that the light was the life of men. You guys remember that? Yeah. It's in John 1. It talks about that. And it doesn't, when I see men. It is a generic term for humankind. It doesn't just mean saved people like Sherry. It means any human being walking on the earth. You have to realize this. Every human being has the life of God on the inside of them. Scripture talks about this. You cannot be alive. It's in uh, Job and in, in Ecclesiastes both. It said if God decided to inhale his spirit from the earth, all man would vanish. Scripture. John 1. The light of God was the life of men. Okay? At any moment in time, if he decided to just, you know what, I'm going to take my spirit up off the earth, no man would live. Because his spirit is in all mankind. It's that, it's that breath of life that connects. And then when mom and dad DNA comes together, it creates this living soul. And it started in the mind of God, Jeremiah 1.5. Okay? You guys know these scriptures. I've talked about them a lot. Talked about them enough. Okay? So this is how we're made. This is how we're created. And beautiful things happen. This word, this term, living soul, isn't just talking about inside of uh, our body here is a soul. The term living soul refers to a human being. You guys remember in Acts when it says uh, 3,000 souls were added that day. You guys remember that? Mm -hmm. We're talking about human beings. You know, when, it's, a, it's a biblical term that can be interchanged between people and soul. So you're not just talking about the soul of you was saved. No, the whole of you is saved. The idea that a soul can be interchangeably called, Jason, you're a living soul. You're not just a body. You're a living soul. All of you, all together. Okay, so the important part of this begins to play out when we see that we have a tendency to believe I cannot get these caps off and hold my notes. I got too much stuff and not enough places to put it. Do you want the podium for your laptop? I'm thinking about it. I need something to have Oh, you need another pen. Yeah, we can do that. Thank you. Yeah. So the word soul in Scripture can mean the entire being of a person, not just the being soul. You guys with me on this? You understand that? That that's an interchangeable term? Because what I want to get to tonight, I want to get to show you how body, soul, and spirit, we have done a great job of separating these three characteristics into three separate entities, okay? And the reality is, that's not biblical thought at all. Biblical thought is that they are interchangeable, inter intertwined so much that it's almost impossible to separate them, okay? Watch out. Okay. Oh, thank you, man. I appreciate that. No problem. Okay. So man is dependent, oh, we already talked about that. Man in, mankind in general is dependent upon the breath of God to even exist. We read it from Job 1. It's also in Job and Ecclesiastes. I'm not going to make us turn all there because i got a lot to go through. Okay, we're, we're created in the same way Adam was in the womb of the mother. We talked about that already. Let me see where I'm going. Okay, one thought that I have, and I think it's, it needs to be very much explained, is that 
There's also a Greek mindset thought that at some point in time, before you existed in the natural, you existed spiritually. Has anybody ever heard this teaching? Mm -hmm. Actually, there's a lot of Christians that actually believe that you were in heaven before you came to earth. Okay? That is not a biblical viewpoint. You won't find that anywhere in Scripture. But that was very much a Greek view of humanity. That we were heavenly creatures and then downloaded into physical bodies and then we will go back to that place. That's not a biblical point of view. That's not Hebrew thought. That's not Jesus thought. That is Greek thought. And they applied that. The Hellenized Jews began to apply that and spread that message. But it's not necessarily a biblical point of view. Okay. So if you've ever heard that taught before, i got to tell you, it doesn't come up next from Scripture. Okay? It does bring up a question. This place in the Bible, I'm not a Bible scholar, but there's a place where it says, I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. Jeremiah 1.5. Okay. Then the word was. Right? Yeah, that was it. That was the one I was talking about right here. We existed well, in the mind of Would that lead towards thinking that maybe... They could think that it was. Like, we were before we were. Yeah. But that's reincarnation, isn't it? <laughs> to muzzle this guy <laughs> the idea was think about this did anybody imagine their children before they had them yeah I did. oh yeah I did mm -hmm. too I thought about even what my wife would be like mm -hmm. and then I thought some of you are like, you've even seen your haven't you seen your son yeah God has actually given Courtney a vision of what her son looks like that's beautiful it doesn't does he exist yet no no but she's it's in her mind. Mm -hmm. now, who, who gave her that thought? God, God. God did, absolutely. You know why? Because he's imagining what he's going to be like one day. Now, she'd like to hurry that process up a little bit, <laughs> but we're letting God take his time. Mm -hmm. We're chastening the You're Lord. talking about... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, let's move on. But thank you for bringing that up. That's Jeremiah 1.5. Before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. He even goes farther than that. He says, I appointed you a prophet to the nation. In other words, he had a call on Jeremiah's life before he was ever even formed in your mother's womb. So do all of you. All right. So let's start talking about how we have kind of pictured and kind of created this image of the soul. I want to specifically focus on the soul for a minute. So we're going to take it out here, and we're going to put it the way we have been taught. How many people have been taught this wonderful principle of the soul. The soul is what? Yeah, we've all heard this. The mind, body, and soul. will, and emotions. We've all heard that. And we, feel, and we feel like that is a great definition of the soul. But do you see how that fits so nice and categorized into this idea of it's orderly, it makes sense. And so this, this is the part of us that thinks. This is the part of us that decides things, that turns us one way or makes us choose this way, and then it also makes us feel. Okay? How many people believe this about the soul? I have. I've been taught this forever until I started reading scripture. For like for the first time, it seemed like. Okay? And so that began the process of me actually searching out and thinking about what actually does the soul look like. Right? And so we have to start thinking about it scripturally. The Greeks thought that soul was the invisible part of us trapped inside our body. Now, how many people have heard this term before? I am a spiritual creature having a natural experience. Or how many people have said that this is, this is not really me. This is just my temporary house until the real me can be freed from this thing and I'm eventually going to be some spiritual creature. Okay? Somewhere along the line, that's normally what we have heard and believed about how we were created and how we were made. That's not Hebrew thought at all. Okay? I wish I had a mirror in here. I do, right here. We do? Oh, that is awesome! <laughs> Did that just appear? <laughs> that is so freaking cool. Okay. I'm going to use that in just a second. So, Greek thought is that the soul is the invisible part of Kim. And what we see on the outside, that's eventually going to go away. Hallelujah, says Kim, and maybe some of us who don't like the way we look or feel or think. And so, and one day we're going to look completely different, and we're going to have this unbelievable experience with the Lord, and we're going to be perfect in all of these things. And that did not come from God. That mindset came from Greeks who could not handle Hebrew thought. 
and kind of pressed Hebrew thought into specific categories so it could make sense, so they could explain it to their students. The reality is, Hebrew thought is that the body and the soul are intricately entwined to the point where, what's your soul look like? <laughs> this is what Kim's soul looks like. You guys need to see this. Your body and your soul are intertwined. How do I know this? Am I just making this up? How did Saul know it was Samuel when he called Samuel up after Samuel died? Didn't he see him? He, he saw him. Like him. Must have looked like him. Well, how did he look like him if he was dead? Because the soul and the body is intertwined. Bam! <laughs> <laughs> she learn. What about when the rich man and Lazarus have an encounter? You guys remember this? Mm -hmm. The parable of the rich man and Lazarus, and Lazarus was the the beggar outside. Sorry, Lazarus was the beggar outside the rich man's house, and every day he would pass Lazarus, and eventually Lazarus dies and goes to the bosom of Abraham, and, La and the rich man ends up in oh. hell, which is another really cool illustration. Heaven and hell can see each other. Right. Because there's the rich man in hell talking to Lazarus who's in heaven, and he's seeing him in the bosom of Abraham, and he's saying, oh, that water that you have there, could you just touch it and just touch my tongue to reduce my... You guys okay? Yeah. Okay. To reduce my suffering that I'm going through. How did he know? How, how do you recognize him? How do you recognize Abraham? How do you recognize Lazarus? How do they recognize Jesus? Yeah, that's, I was, what I was thinking. that's where I was going. Thank you. Oh, my last one. How did they recognize Jesus? Now, at first, they didn't. You guys remember that? Yeah. At first, it had to almost like he had to open their eyes to see. So there is a change, but there's also a very much a reality. How do I know that it's the same? Because in heaven, first of all, when we look at some of the descriptions of Jesus, even after, let's say, before he even goes to heaven, when he resurrects, what does he still have? Still has holes. How does he have that if he isn't his unbelievably new being? Okay? Because he was all man, all God. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. The soul, here's another scripture that's really important. The life is in the what? What does the scripture say? Life is in the blood. That's also an interchangeable term with soul is in the blood. Okay? The physical blood carries the soul. That's why all the Jews weren't allowed to what? Drink blood or eat the meat with the blood. Because you were doing what? You were eating the soul of the animal. And that was illegal under Jewish law and custom. Why would you? Because the blood can... So, right here, as blood flows through my fingers, so is my soul. Right here. Okay? The soul is wherever you are. The soul is wherever your physical body is. So my soul's in my ear, my soul's in this big nose, my soul's in my kneecap, my soul is everywhere my body is. They're intertwined. You guys with me so far? Mm -hmm. Yep. Alright, this is good. So soul and body are one. They're the express image of each other in the other realm. So, for example, this is really important to see. So, even Paul talks about this when he says, I can't wait to shed this tent. Remember he talks about this? So, there is a difference between the body that we live in now because it is subject to what? Corruption or decay. Okay, this body does age. Have you found that out? <laughs> it does get sick. <laughs> Have you found that out? If you eat fatty things, you get dang it. Okay? But, <laughs> but there is a body that's coming that looks just like the one you have now that's no longer subject to decay. And Paul talks about this. I can't wait to get that one that no longer dies, that death can't attach to anymore. It'll, it'll, still, it'll still look like the same body you have now? It'll look like it. I'll be able to recognize you and you'll be able to recognize me. Absolutely. There's been enough encounters, just not even scripturally. I mean, I just gave you three examples scripturally, or I gave you two, and Randy gave you one. But anybody had a, anybody ever read or heard of someone that had a near-death experience and saw grandfather, or saw their mother, or saw how they recognize them? Absolutely. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, my brother saw my father in a whole bang, and they sent him back because he died twice. 
My brother that died in November. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. There's an awesome book out there called The Shack. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. You just have random thoughts, don't you? It's not that random. That's just going to be like nannies. Okay. So let's now let's talk about this particular thing, okay? Because right now most of us are still stuck here. Okay. This is I'm kind of giving you some new thoughts about your soul right now. And forgive me if this is in the way of you guys being able to see this, but I needed that there. So let's talk about this now in terms of this new soul body. So let's just ask this question. Where do your thought processes take place? All right, hold on a second. We're going to use Courtney as the example tonight. All right. So, there she is. She's got nice hair here. Okay, so this is Courtney body. This is Courtney soul. The reason why I drew them roughly the same way is because we just talked about how the body and the soul look the same. Okay? All right. So, where, okay, and then we have to also describe the spirit somehow. Now, I don't believe the spirit looks like you because the spirit has so much to do with the Lord. So there's this, there's this life, there's this energy. I'm not afraid to use the word energy. It's not a new age term. It's a God term. There's, there's power. There's this unbelievable life that comes from the Lord. So, I don't know, we'll, we'll draw him like a sun. I have no idea how to describe him. Mm -hmm. Okay? Okay? And this is Courtney's spirit. Okay? She's shining bright. I call her sunshine a lot. Okay. So, we've got Courtney body, Courtney soul, and Courtney spirit. All right. So, here's the question. Again, where do your thought processes take place? Your heart. Okay? I think your soul. In your mind. Yeah, your soul. Okay, so we got heart, we got mind, and we got soul. <laughs> your mind is part of your soul. Over here it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Does your body have a mind? Let's just go with each one of your answers. We're going to go with is mind, mind first. Is mind brain? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, okay, you got thought process up here. Courtney thinks once in a while. Okay? Is she use, do you know thought is a, thought is a chemical reaction? You guys realize that, right? Yeah. Anybody that does any kind of little bit of scientific research will tell you that thought happens as a result of a chemical reaction in your brain. Neurons connect. They, they light up. They, they zip things all around. That's a physical thing that takes place. Does her soul have a mind that thinks? Sure, absolutely. That mind thinks. Because it has to take these chemical reactions and it has to... It has feeling associated with it, and there are um, decisions that have to be made. Chemical reactions can't make decisions, but this can. So there's a, there's a mind in her body, there's a mind in her soul. Is there a mind of the spirit? Absolutely there is. Who can know the thoughts of God except the spirit of God? And those, those thoughts are downloaded into our spirit. Our mind. You guys realize all three have a mind. Mm -hmm. Scripturally. All right, let's go to the next one. Wait, before you make uh, Huh? What did you say? Is that why you argue with yourself? Absolutely. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Doesn't Job 38 talk about this? Job 38. Job. 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 Go ahead. Go ahead. What? Um, it says God speaks to Job. Uh, then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwinds and said, This is a dark uh, Who is this that darkens counsel? By words without knowledge, now grind up your lines like a man. And I will ask you, and you instruct me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have an uh, understanding. But it goes on and on and on. And then it says, When I made a cloud garment and thick and darkness, swaddle and band, and I placed boundaries on it. And I set it to bolt the doors, and then I said, Thus you shall come, but no further. And here shall your proud ways stop. But it pretty much, I don't know, like, it's kind of like, I don't know, that's what I got from it. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what you're saying. Yeah, I, I really like the way you search scripture, Luke. I really appreciate that, and how you're applying what you're hearing to scriptures that remind you of it. That's really yeah, good. Yeah, but I, I might be wrong. No, you're not wrong. 
Hey, you search scripture, you're not going to go wrong there. So I appreciate it. Keep doing what you're doing. So, let's go to this. Now, let's just talk about the heart. Someone answered heart here. I think Randy did, right? Does your body have a heart? Yes. What does it do? Pump blood. Pumps blood. And the life is in the blood. Does her, does her soul have a heart? Yeah. Oh, heck yeah. That's where her, the, her emotions come up. And what she, how she loves children and how she loves her father and how she loves life and whatever. And she, you know, whatever else she loves. Does her, does her spirit yes. have a heart? Yep. How do we know that? David was left for God's own heart. Absolutely. How about, um, oh, what's a good one here? Uh, rivers of living water shall flow from your innermost being. Just as the heart pumps blood to all the parts of her body, just as this pumps all of those feelings and issues of life, right? From the heart flow all the issues of life, Proverbs. Same here. As these rivers of life flow from the heart that's on the inside of her, it feeds all areas of her life with life. All of her body. Go ahead. So everything fires together at the same time. You got it. Okay. We can keep going on like this. Let's just do one more. Uh, where are your emotions? We're doing this. We're, we're trying to kind of fit this category, right? Where are your... Do you know that she, her body has emotions? Just like thought, emotions are chemical reactions, okay? How do we know this? Well, here's a couple examples. Has anybody been stressed? Yeah. <laughs> How does that affect you physically? Make you sick. Makes you sick. Does your stomach start to churn and turn? Start to sweat. Blood pressure goes up. Headaches, migraines. Your body has emotion. Does your soul have emotion? I was just—is that the same as like an actual physical fear? Like something yep. startles you as a absolutely. That's your physical yeah. protection. Yeah. Right. Does her soul have emotion? Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh my gosh, absolutely. That's where she just starts crying uncontrollably or starts laughing and you can't stop her. You know, those kind of things. That comes from her soul. Does her spirit have emotion? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Has that happened in Scripture? His spirit was grieved. Jesus' spirit was grieved. Your spirit can be joyous. Right? It's all throughout Scripture. Her spirit rejoiced. Okay? All three of them. Do you guys see how they're not separate entities anymore? We have this idea that the mind, will, and emotions is this one area. And if we can kind of have God kind of bring those things in check, then my soul will be okay. It's not that easy. <laughs> in fact, in Scripture, biblically speaking, this is not Bible. It doesn't actually fit what we're finding. You guys are telling me this stuff. I'm not telling you this. You're telling me the Scriptures where mind, will, and emotions are actually in all three beings. Not all in the soul. You guys with me? Mm -hmm. All right. A little bit more. Mark, so are you saying that... Uh, I'm not uh, saying anything. Okay. I'm just telling you what Scripture says. No, no, I'm talking about... But our, <laughs> <laughs> our whole society is departmentalized. Education is. I mean, I, I've said, you know, our, our students, we're so departmentalized that our clients, which is our students, have no clue what we're...